Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a joy to be with all of you this morning. Just some brief announcements before we get started today. First and foremost, you can register your attendance on the welcome cards in the pews in front of you. And if you have a prayer request or a joy to share this morning, you can also use those pray cards that you find in the pews as well. And you can place any of those cards in, the, um, in these little chargers here during any musical piece that you would like. Also, there's a special charge conference meeting to discuss our new incoming pastor, Jessica Strisco. It's going to be tomorrow, Monday at 5 p.m. via Zoom, so please let us know if you're planning to attend, and we'll get you the Zoom link. Also, you can sign up to meet Pastor Jessica. Um, there's a poster out front right next to the Altar Flowers poster. She's going to be having meetings on July 10th, 17th, 24th, and 31st after worship. And she's going to be meeting with small groups. So uh, we, there's 10 slots for each Sunday. So if you'd like to sign up to meet Pastor Jessica and chat with her, you may certainly do so. And if you're part of a couple or a group, please put each name on a separate line just so we can keep those groups small for her. And also, we are feeding you once again uh, on July 3rd. There is a welcome lunch for Pastor Jessica after worship. So please feel free to join that as well. And also, there are some birthday cards for the singlies out on the patio, so please sign those um, if you haven't already after worship. And please now stand, if you're able, for the opening prayer. Please join me in the opening prayer. Speak to us, spirit of wisdom and truth, as we worship this day. 
bind, bind us together, together into a community of love and peace. Live and move in our lives, that we may grow in your spirit, deepen our faithfulness, and display the love, peace, patience, kindness, and generosity you have planted in our souls. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, our first scripture re reading comes to us from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord! 
When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the lake. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. As the choir makes their way to the front, uh, you, you'll see a special name before you, which might not, uh, might not mean a whole lot to you yet. That name is Jake Miles, is the composer of today's piece. Uh, for the past several months, we have been lucky to have a wonderful uh, volunteer singer with us, and that is Jake Miles. Uh, today is actually his last Sunday singing with the choir because he's going to New York University in New York uh, to get his master's in composing. Uh, so he wanted to leave a gift with the Anaheim United Methodist Church Choir and for the Anaheim United Methodist Church. And so this is Jake Miles, and he has composed this piece using the, t the famous text of Instrument of Peace. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it very much today, and that as you watch the choir singing and you look at Jake's face, uh, you know this music comes from him in the glory of God.
Our second scripture reading is from John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me before I offer a message. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I first met Pastor James Dollins, I was around 21 years old and in a bit of a rocky place in my faith journey. I had found myself stumbling over harmful and hurtful theology I had been inundated with in my adolescent years, and I had witnessed a church community I was part of prior to AUMC resort to using those same har harmful and hurtful theological ideas as a weapon against my family. Though I had been singing in the choir as a staff singer for a couple of years before the Dollins family was appointed here, I still had this idea that church was no longer for me. This was all compounded by what I was learning in a couple of classes I signed up to take as electives during my undergraduate degree program, the history of Christian thought. This class was taught by a very intelligent professor who had studied religion, theology, and history, and was helping us to see how scripture had really been written, where religious themes and ideas come from, and how Christianity influenced and was influenced by other ideologies that existed contempor contemporaneously. These classes called a lot of what I had been taught about my faith into question, for me. I realized how hollow and limited my previous beliefs had been, how unrelated to the overall message and work of Jesus my religious education had been, and how as a result of these teachings, I myself had become hard-hearted, judgmental, and closed-minded. Much like anyone confronted in such a way, this realization sent me into a tailspin. I had been confident in my beliefs before. I was even on the apologetics debate team at my Christian high school. That to dig further into history and uncover such truths felt like that foundation I had spent so long building was just crumbling beneath my feet. I figured that it might be worth it as one last ditch effort to orient myself to reach out to Pastor James for help. And what I found surprised me. I saw myself as someone already half out the door. Mentally, I was already gone. I had all but made up my mind that the cognitive dissonance was too loud, too great to overcome. But over several coffee outings and conversations in his office, several times bringing all of my notes from class with me in for him to look over and unpack with me, I found a man who truly did his best to live as a follower of Christ. 
James became my mentor, even more so when I began working here in the office with him. Each week, he would meet with me for an hour or more, helping me to work my way through Scripture and to understand historical context, offering interpretations and translations of Scripture I had not considered before, all through this lens of compassion. I found a man who was not only willing to mentor me and so many others in this church and in his community, but also a man who went out into that community and fought for protections for those most marginalized and disenfranchised. I watched as he sat on the board for Mary's Kitchen and helped at the Neighbors in Need Pantry, advocating for the needs of those experiencing homelessness, food insecurity, and poverty. I witnessed him out among the people in the community, protesting injustice, racism, oppression. We, in fact, attended a counter-protest together in Laguna Beach in 2017 after we learned that hate groups planned to gather to protest there. And I cried as he, dressed in his brightest Sunday morning vestments, joined arm in arm with his Methodist clergy kin to walk up the boardwalk heartily singing, we shall overcome. I felt moved as he used his position at the pulpit to speak in support of women's rights and how he honored the Methodist tradition of giving lay people a platform to speak as well. Around the office, I laughed at all of his dad jokes, even the bad ones, and it brought me such joy to watch him singing along in Spanish to the songs the mariachi band was playing last week. In numerous ways, I found a pastor who was not content to simply invoke the words of Jesus as a balm or a salve, but who was actually out there being the hands and feet of Christ, serving in wisdom and grace, and leading with love and empathy. It is extremely difficult to say goodbye to someone who has helped me form a new foundation. And I also know through conversations that I've had with many of you since we found out about James's departure, that many of you sitting here today have stories of similar encounters with James. I know firsthand how much all of you love and care for James and the whole Dolan's family, and that's exactly what makes this change in leadership so difficult. In general, change is a difficult thing for us to accept, especially big-scale changes like this. When we're faced with changing circumstances, we often lament that we wish things could get back to normal. This has been a common refrain, of course, in the few years since the pandemic started, but this sentiment has been around for far longer, probably since the very beginning of humanity. We crave control and sure knowledge so much so that we often strongly resist change. I'm the first to admit that any change, even small ones, I almost immediately view as negative, partly because I know that changing circumstances also often require me to make changes as well. But change is inevitable in small and large ways. So what we're left with is a decision about how we can cope with and view that change. Our scripture reading for this morning gave me some insight into how we can cope with and view this change that we're experiencing. Our passage begins with the story of some of the disciples' miraculous catch of fish and ends with a conversation between Jesus and Peter. This excerpt follows directly after the story of Jesus' resurrection and subsequent appearance to the disciples. This is after Jesus has appeared to Mary at the tomb and also after he has confronted doubting Thomas. In short, now the disciples know that Jesus has risen and have seen him in person. They know that he has completed this part of his ministry. Their world is completely changing under their feet, and soon— they will be all together without their leader physically present with them on earth. I imagine that these disciples probably felt just about how we feel right now. 
A difficult combination of feelings. The fear of the unknown, the fear of change, the hopefulness that they had received over the course of Jesus' ministry, the vision that they had for the new church that would encompass all followers of Jesus, and the responsibility they had as witnesses of Christ. Now, of course, I don't mean to imply here that Pastor James is Jesus, but that fear that we might experience as a leader that we've trusted wholeheartedly departs from us is reminiscent of that same fear and confusion the disciples may have experienced also. Imagine yourself in the sandals of the disciples at this moment in time. They have spent years of their lives dedicating themselves to learning from a man who is revolutionizing the way they look at their faith and their God. They watched as religious authorities questioned his teachings and practices. They witnessed their leader unjustly murdered by leaders, and now here he is appearing to them again. They are also well aware that Jesus will be leaving them soon, ascending to be with God, the eternal parent in heaven, and the full weight of the responsibility they bear as witnesses after Jesus' ascension is starting to come crashing down on them all. That is a lot of change to take in all at one time. A lot of intimidating and hard-to-swallow change. And in this time of uncertainty and fear, Peter says something that some of us here might be able to resonate with. I'm going fishing. In this, Peter returns to his normal. Before he was a disciple, Peter was a fisherman. We might not all be fishermen. We might not all find comfort in sitting around in a boat waiting for fish to bite, but Peter clearly did. Whether or not Peter was aware of it at the time, this is a helpful way for us to cope with change also. When things are changing around us, we can return to those things that bring us peace, that grant us normalcy, something we know we can do well, something we can accomplish. I encourage you to find those things in your own life. What things help return you to yourself when your whole life is chaotic and unpredictable? Where do you find peace and rest? For Peter, it was in a boat with some of his closest companions, doing what he did best. But in this story, for Peter, unfortunately, this trip only added insult to injury, because you'll notice at first they weren't actually able to complete the task. Their nets kept coming up empty. What a frustrating situation to go back to something that you usually find comfort in, only to find no satisfaction. That's when they notice that there's someone standing on the shore, and they realize fairly quickly that it's Jesus. And you'll also notice that Jesus doesn't scold them, for being out on a boat fishing while all of this life-changing stuff is happening. He doesn't reprimand them for seeking out peace and normalcy. Instead, he simply offers a very small suggestion. Just try dropping your nets on the other side of the boat. This isn't a call for them to hang up their nets completely, to abandon their talents and come to shore to find something more worthwhile to do. It's just a tiny shift in something they were already doing. Just give it a try. Just drop those nuts over the other side and see what happens. There's no guarantee that this tactic would work any better, but the disciples are surprised to find that now their nuts are so heavy they can't even pull them up into the boat anymore. This perspective shift is important. Here, Jesus reminds them to assess the situation. By all means, continue doing the things that bring you peace, that bring you comfort, but ensure in that comfort you're not finding complacency. In our comfort, what things have we not tried? In our comfort, what things have we overlooked? What possibilities have we ignored or simply not seen? In times of change, we have a rare opportunity to step back, to look more objectively, and to assess. What 
might we be missing? What nets are still coming up empty? There's never a guarantee that any change will yield the results that we want it to. But Jesus' suggestion here to the disciples reminds us that even within our routine, even within our normal, we can make tiny adjustments that can propel us toward growth and greater success. This section of the passage points out how this idea of normal can sometimes be a double-edged sword. Peter seeks out normal routine and is unable to catch fish at first without Jesus' suggestion to try something new. Just drop the nets on the other side of the boat. Peter's normal or average operating procedures would not have netted, if you'll excuse the pun, any results had he not made these small adjustments. And that idea made me think of a a section of a book I read called The End of Average, written by Todd Rose. The End of Average begins with the story of the United States Air Force in the 1940s. It was a time when there were an unusual number of crashes occurring, with most of them being chalked up to human error because the planes were not found to be malfunctioning. But the occurrences were so frequent and the pilots trained so well that it seemed that something else had to be happening. It turned out that there was. The cockpits had been designed for a normal-sized pilot based on the physical dimensions of hundreds of male pilots measured in the 1920s. And the solution to this wasn't what you might expect. The average hadn't changed in the previous two decades. It's just that a normal pilot doesn't exist. If you've designed a cockpit to fit the normal or average pilot, Todd Rose tells us, you've actually designed it to fit no one. Todd Rose uses that opening anecdote to make a simple and startling conclusion. Any system that lingers too long or that is built around this idea of normal or average or expected won't see much growth. Find those things that bring you comfort and a sense of normalcy, but at the same time, don't allow that normalcy to slide into stagnation. Change is necessary for our growth. Even small changes, like the ones the U.S. Air Force found to correct that crashing problem, like adjustable seats, pedals, flight suits, and controls, had far-reaching positive effects. Even small changes like just dropping that net over the other side of the boat, can yield more success. Change gives us an opportunity to assess what new directions we now have at our disposal for growth. And just as those fish were always there in the water, there is hope and there are possibilities and newness that we may not see yet that are already there for us. Sometimes our fear limits us from seeing or fully grasping that hope, but it's there. It sometimes just takes someone with an outside perspective to remind us to open our eyes to it, to remind us to drop our nets on the other side of the boat. Try something new. So Jesus here encourages the disciples in their pursuit of normalcy while still reminding those present that even those small adjustments can be good for growth. Find comfort while also striving for progress. Jesus also reminds Peter and the others there at the shore to refocus their attention on what is paramount through a conversation that Jesus has with Peter. This conversation is notable, as if you'll recall, Peter was the one who denied Christ three times. And here we have a beautiful reversal of that. Jesus asking Peter three times if he loves him. And each time Peter responds with, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And each of those times Jesus responds to Peter, Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Again, there's no radical shift happening here. 
There's no long list of demands Jesus asks his disciples to follow here. Instead, in the midst of huge and earth-shattering change, Jesus reminds us what is important. Caring for one another. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. Nourish them. Guide them. Care for them. Build them up. Foster their faiths. Strengthen them. Advocate for them. This is what we need to center. Things may change around us. Leaders might come and go. But we remain. As a community emboldened by God's caring love and grace, to extend that same love and grace to each other and to ourselves. If Peter takes nothing else away from this interaction, I hope it's the same thing we can take away from reading about this interaction, that we are all capable of doing the work of God's church in the world. I see this work already at AUMC in the ways that so many of you step up each week to volunteer at the Neighbors in Need Pantry, assisting 800 or more households every month. I see it in the prayer shawl ministry, in the women of faith ministry, in how you give of your time to join committees, in caroling through the community and the Easter egg hunt every Easter. I see it in the way that you rally to support friends and members of this church, and those in our community, how you care for each other and encourage each other. I see a close community of people who also long to be God's hands and feet. I see a community of people who are welcoming, affirming, kind-hearted, and hardworking, who give so much of themselves in love for one another. I have no doubt that Pastor Jessica will, as I have, Count herself lucky to have found a congregation who is already so adept at tending and feeding God's flock. I also have no doubt that Pastor Jessica will help to tend and feed us as well. In our brief conversations thus far, she has demonstrated that she is a woman of intelligence, integrity, compassion, empathy, and grace. But my friends, I also stand here this morning to affirm your grief. I want to validate your feelings of sadness and loss. We fear change because often change comes with mourning some piece of our sense of that normalcy. And in this case, we're losing people who are beloved to us. And it's okay to grieve that loss together. It's okay to take time to process your feelings and adjust to this change. At the same time, though, don't let that fear that you experience and the sadness you experience paralyze you to the possibility and the love that Pastor Jessica will bring our congregation. It might look very different than we're used to, but we are resilient people. I've seen this church endure change and adjust to newness, and this situation is no different. So that's why I'm coining a new term, pneumal. This idea is inspired by Reverend Mark Davies of St. Mark Presbyterian in Newport Beach. It's not normal, as in getting back to normal, because that kind of retrogression isn't always automatically a positive step. It's not new, because we often seem to imagine that anything new is likewise improved, and that's not always the case either. And it's not the new normal, which is a term that we optimistically imply will arise when some chaotic episode destroys the old normal. In order to avoid normal and new and new normal, I offer pneumal. (laughs) Here's how I define pneumal and how the Oxford English Dictionary might define it too if they would pay attention to me and (laughs) and grant it some legitimacy. The opportunity, to f- the opportunity following a disruption to reassess, to discover that some things we took for granted are quite precious and we need them, to realize that some things were simply what we did by momentum or inertia, 
to accept that a disruption can be devastating in so many ways, and yet still hold some promise to refocus on who we are called to be. As one can see in the word, there is acknowledgement of the new, but not with the arrogance that we have greater wisdom than our forebears. And the word acknowledges once we, w- what we once thought of as normal, but not in a way that it grants the past unquestioned authority. The power of Numal is that it arises from the dynamic interplay of both the great things God has done and the new things that God is doing. My friends, I encourage you to grieve and to mourn. I encourage you to feel whatever you feel in this season of change. I encourage you to find what brings you joy and peace and normalcy. But I invite you also to just make small changes or try to accept those small changes a little at a time. Just to drop your nets over the other side of the boat, just to see what happens. I invite you to take a step back, to assess and to adjust, to keep your eyes open for possibilities, and above all, to continue to feed and tend God's flock. Although I can't say for certain whether Pastor Jessica will sit on the board of Mary's Kitchen or sing at the top of her lungs with a mariachi band like we saw James do last week, I can say that I am hopeful that her appointment here will be filled with love and with joy. I can say that I am hopeful we will find Pastor Jessica to be an advocate and to come alongside us to do the work Jesus asks us to do, helping us to embrace the new mole. Amen. Please remain seated as we sing together hymn number 534, Be Still My Soul.
Heavenly Parent, we gather together today looking for your wisdom as things around us change. We turn our hearts and our minds to your message, to your hopes for us, and to your ardent desire for a better society. In the midst of uncertainty, we above all uphold your care and your grace. We promise to celebrate your identities and your communities as beloved, to be a place of harbor when the world is cruel, and to grow in our own understanding and practices of loving you. Now we lift to you our joys, our prayers, and our petitions in this time of silent prayer. It is good, Holy Spirit, to find hope and healing in your presence. Now hear our prayers for those who especially need your care today. For our home-centered members who cannot be with us in person, but are with us in spirit, Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. For your church in all of its ministries, may we always strive to serve others. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. For all those who serve in the military and those who are related to our own church members, for those who serve as firefighters, paramedics, police officers, and anyone who puts their safety at risk to keep us safe, as we pray always for God's peace to prevail on earth. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. For missionaries, for those working with relief organizations, and for all those working for peace, may God go with them. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. For the people of Afghanistan who are suffering from a massive earthquake, for the thousands that have been killed and displaced in our suffering, may they find safety and peace. And for the women and girls in Afghanistan, may they all be treated with dignity and respect. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. For people whose hearts are filled with hate, may their woundedness be healed. And for the victims of hate, may they find peace and healing. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. And we have some prayers from the congregation this morning. From Luann, for my son Brian, who was seriously injured in a a bicycle accident. May he be healed. Lord, in your grace, Hear our prayer. And um, an anonymous one, a praise. My husband's eye surgery was successful. Praise the Lord. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. And from Marianne, uh, for safe travel home to Washington for our daughter, Julie. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. And from Linda Boyle, uh, prayers, please, for the Duran family. Ken's father, Walter, was just placed on hospice. Walter and Gwen just celebrated their 66th wedding anniversary on June the 8th. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. And from Sharon, uh, for Wendy Lee, she's not well, and her sister has hired a caregiver. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. We offer all of our prayers in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us continue in worship, bringing offerings as we are able for the work of God's church in the world. Generous God, you are always with us, always caring for us, always drawing us together. We are so grateful for your loving presence. We bring our gifts before you today, that this offering can be reached out in love to your people everywhere. Amen.
the other side of the boat, always keeping our eyes open for God's possibilities. Amen.